Hey, this is Mike from the Graphic Novel Show. Are you interested in starting and running your own podcast? Well, you know, this is the second one that we've done. We used to do a different one, and we decided to start this one. And last time we used Anchor, and you know what? We decided to go back with Anchor again because they are the easiest way to make a podcast. They give you everything you need in one place for free. You can do it right from your phone or on your computer. Anchor gives you creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. You can do that right from your phone. That's quite amazing. They'll also distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can easily make money from your, po- uh, from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Now, what you need to do is go download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi, I'm Parker. And I'm Mike. And And this this is is the the Graphic Graphic Novel Novel Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to our new podcast on the art of the graphic novel. Mike is the author of 10 books and produced Comics TV, which was a weekly TV show on comics for seven years back in the 90s. Back in the olden days. (laughs) uh, Together, we produced Northwest Brew Talk about the beer industry in the Northwest for two years. Now we're back, and this show is all about graphic novels. Hello, and welcome to the Graphic Novel Podcast. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Surviving. Yep, that's always a uh, plus in this <laughs> world. In this world. Yeah. yeah. So we've got uh, some good stuff going on. Got a good book uh, this week. Yes. I I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really good. Um, before that, going to do, uh, we got a, a preview of a new book from uh, Titan Comics. And it's uh, Ryuku. It's by Eldo Yoshi Mizu, and it's got some like uh, some great reviews from a lot of a lot of different size uh, sources, and it's basically um, two volumes uh, manga printed in that style. Uh, you read right to left, and uh, they're like two hundred and fifty or more pages each. Uh, second volume of this hits the stores October fifteenth, so it's a uh, they're. Um, Titan Comics Hard Case Crimes first manga title, stunning tale of revenge, international terrorism, and the Japanese mafia. So, uh, pretty interesting. I liked it. Uh, I didn't read the whole thing; just it, there didn't have enough time to get through it all. But uh, it's crime kind of stuff I like. Yeah, not my jam. No, not your jam, but uh, stuff I like. So, just wanted to mention that's coming out. So, check it out. And the book that we read this month. Week. Week. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. Mm. <laughs> it's a weekly podcast. It is. Thanks for the reminder. No problem. <laughs> is Bottom Theaters. Oh, yes. By Ezra Clayton Daniels and Ben Passmore. Give a little uh, summary here. From Fanagraphics books. Oh, Fanagraphics. Yep, that's right. Where we bought, where I bought my first. That's right. Novel. Here in Seattle. It's a pretty cool shop. It is. Yeah. We have to go back in. We do need to go. Now we're even closer. We should go more often. I know. The kids have fun in there too, didn't they? I think they did. Did we buy stuff for them there? I don't think we did. I can't remember. All right. Once a thriving working class neighborhood on Chicago's south side, the Bottom Yards, is now the definition of urban blight. When an aspiring fashion designer and her image-obsessed BFF descend upon the hood in search of cheap rent, they discover something far more seductive and deadly. Yes, this is a it's an interesting form. It's hardcover. Um, what size is it? This is like um, it's like eight by six something. Like yeah, that. it it's is funky, funky, isn't it? Funky yeah. size, almost three hundred pages. Um, color, full color, 
very, very cool. Oh man, I loved I loved the color in this. So Ezra Clayton Daniels is a writer and illustrator based in LA. His work has been featured at uh, festivals in Switzerland and the Netherlands and at the Whitney Museum. His previous graphic novel, Upgrade Soul, was the recipient of the 2017 Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity in Comics. Ben Passmore is a Philadelphia-based cartoonist. He self-publishes Day Glowy Hole. Glowy Hole. That's what it looks like. A comic series in equal parts about the apocalypse and anxiety. Ben's work has appeared in Vice, The Nib, As You Were, Now, and Felony. His critically acclaimed mini-comic, Your Black Friend, was the 2017 Dinky Award winner for Best Mini-Comic, an Eisner Award nominee for Best One-Shot, and winner of the Ignatz Award for Outstanding Comic. So these two guys got some uh, some creds. Yeah, And sure. um, this... Story. I mean, start. It starts out. You, you you're not quite sure what what it is. I mean, it starts out with a with a like a uh, gas meter guy or something like that. Uh, they're at yeah. this at this building, and he's like, "There's something something wrong with this house. There's just something wrong Apart- with this, this building. building. Yeah. Yes, yeah. there's just something wrong with it." Yeah. And he decides to crawl underneath it to uh to check it out, and uh, he's he, with he's he with another a duck, guy, right? He's yeah, well, like he crawls under and <laughs> he comes out with this goop all over him. Uh-huh. The other guy has to pull him out because he's like screaming, and there's this goop all over him. And he's determined throughout throughout the book. He's determined to find out what is going on in this house. Um, reptilian hybrid technology. Yeah, yeah. Don't oh, you read history? <laughs> that, that's right. He's a conspiracy <laughs> theorist too. And uh, so the the book is a a sci fi horror story about gentrification yeah i didn't read like the summary or anything beforehand i just jumped right in Mm -hmm. and so my first thought was um that it was just like a sci-fi right thing right um especially with the hybrid technology (laughs) exactly what so yeah so i mean it starts out with that that guy and i immediately love the color too so most of the comics that we read are um or the graphic novels, I guess, are mm. black and white. Right. And so it's always a nice change of pace to have colors. And then the colors aren't, it's not just like full color. It's like the pages all have one color and like yellow. Right. And everything's yellow. And then everything's green. And then everything's purple. It's it's funky. I like it. Well, in uh, an NPR interview they did earlier this year, uh, Passmore said that uh, he had a fascinate he has a fascination with non-literal coloring. Mm. And he said that generally a horror story has is a gritty look and it has a lot of um, browns or heavy blues. And he felt he didn't want people to, to know that it was a horror story, like to confuse them. So they didn't really figure it out right away. Yeah. And that's what it does. Cause these colors are, they're different colors. They're darker colors, mm-hmm. but the way that the way that he uses them is, is really cool. Yeah. And I, uh, it's kind of funny because if I would have, thought about the fact that it was horror i might not want to read it because i'm not a big horror but it wasn't person, a scary but, it, but it, yeah i think i think and i haven't read any graphic novels that are horror up until now so maybe maybe horror in a graphic novel form wouldn't bother me so much mm-hmm. but right. like movies i can't sit and watch uh horror movies anymore so yeah I, it's kind of opened me up to maybe reading some more horror graphic novels which is pretty cool that's too. cool yes because uh, uh, seeing somebody's head cut off or something on a page is different than <laughs> watching it in action you know even though you know it's fake it just looks so real right yeah is it fake on, what do you oh, on a movie in a movie is it yeah it's fake are you sure like wrestling <laughs> that's, that's not fake but I mean, there's some goreiness to it. Um, oh yeah, definitely. But nothing. I mean, like a guy's arms get ripped off at one point. So the purpose of the horror in this story, right, is to to turn the tables on gentrification and white people, basically, by having this building basically be alive and you know turn on the people. Yeah. Yeah, and then you get to the part of the story where you like the backstory where you kind of learn about how that monster came to be and, mm-hmm. and it's so the building itself is is alive and self-sustaining by poop. It it <laughs> it is what happens is the we one We do a lot of poop talk. The podcast. one character <laughs> the one character his mother and and he have lived in the in the building his whole life. 
And now they're moving out. Right. Or they're being forced out, I should say. His aunt is the one who built it. She was an architect. Right. And she built it, designed it. And I don't remember exactly what her reason for designing it the way she did. Do you? It was a... I don't know. I'm trying to remember if what I read is... Because I read an article and I couldn't find it again when I when we came to record. But it talked about like it was it was meant to be a prison. But I mean, that wasn't the intention. No, 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 no. Her, 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 what was, what, when she designed this, that's right. When she des- made this design, it was like uh, a new thing. And the government the tech- wanted to use it correct, to, correct. for prisons and stuff. And I think she wasn't happy with that. Uh, yeah. So I think that, the, right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So the idea was that, that she was designed. I don't remember. It, it's in the book. Mm-hmm. Self-sustaining. Self-sust- self-sustaining things. So, so the short version is the building is in the bottom feeders. It's a neighborhood, a black neighborhood in Chicago that even the police don't go to. They refuse to go to the neighborhood. And the neighbor, the, the, the building has been bought by an investor. Yeah. And how many times have, have you heard that? You know, what the police won't go there. Mm hmm. Like we're not we're not going we're not going there unless it's a real emergency yeah. and a and real we, emergency does not include the lives of black people yeah. or people of color and we need five cop cars ten cops each right exactly yeah guns blazing yeah well sorry I mean yes it 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 is that kind of policing has gone on for years I mean it's not just against black people but in in this day and age it it seems to be more well, it, people of color in general mm-hmm. if if it, if that's you know, mm-hmm. it's frustrating. I mean, beyond frustrating, it's disgusting. And yes, it's- exactly. So the house has been, or the building's been bought. And uh, I don't know, did this guy, did he own it or was he just run it? Was he the manager of it? The guy that, uh, mm-hmm. he's the owner. Okay, he's the G- owner. Gene. Gene, yeah, right. He's kind of trashy, but he bought it. He probably bought it at a discount because it's in a, it's in a quote unquote bad neighborhood and uh, he's uh, renting it out to art students advertising it at the art school. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's where the story comes together where um, the two main characters, um, a a black girl and her, her BFF white friend. um, Well, the black girl rents an apartment there. And that's kind of how the the story rolls, and an event. And because it, the building had only had a couple of tenants for years, it kind of went dormant. But with more people moving in and flushing their toilets, and uh, the building woke up. So that's kind of what happened. So the idea was that it was going to create this self sustaining, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, um, building so it eats its it eats the waste and that mm-hmm. powers it and gives and does you know heats the building and oh, that's right that's right it powers it and everything that's what it, right right and that's why the government liked it because then they could have their you know self sustaining prisons and everything they wouldn't have to exactly. have, anything they didn't have, to have anybody outside. in there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. exactly she said if they keep um she said I'm drowning it before it can hurt anybody and uh, uh Char- Charlie Charlie. Yeah, says, but it's nice. And then um, his auntie says, I know it is, but if they keep making me change it, pretty soon it won't be nice anymore. What won't be nice? The monster, the, oh. the creation. Oh, yeah. This is, he was, when he was younger, talking to his aunt. Right. right. That's right. Because the government wanted the her to, to make it, you know, for their use. And uh, it's, a, it, it's a cool story. What I don't understand is if she drowned it, and killed it, how did it come back? I don't think she really killed it, obviously. But she did, though, right? Like, it, she's stomping it and... She tried to. And drowning it. She says the only way that it can die is to drown. Right, but I don't think it completely did. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously it didn't. But... So. And then the colors change. Why it. don't we have a little discussion about... I mean, we are not experts by any means. Yeah. Uh, but we'll have a little discussion about gentrification and... Well, we lived in a medium, would you call medium, small, medium-sized city? I mean, it's definitely not, it's not a, a small city, I don't think, but maybe yeah. in in New York terms, maybe it is. Well, it's the second biggest city in New York State. But, but it's not a big city. 
it's not a big city. I mean, at one point there was. Is there a city here that a, you could compare it to? Do you think? Actually, I was thinking about that this morning. In in Everett, uh, Everett is probably pretty similar in population size. Okay, but it's not the same. It's not, but the it doesn't same. have I the mean, same history. I mean, no. that's that's part of it too. I mean, Buffalo is a big city. Yeah, it was built to be a big city. Yeah, and then it stopped growing. Yeah. You know, the, the, everything changed, you know, the industrial era ended and steel making ended and all these things and, mm-hmm. and Buffalo stopped growing. So, so we lived on the city's West side, but you have history before, before this. Before that. Um, woman I was with, uh, owned a house in this uh, neighborhood called Schiller Park, which was, uh, at one point a German neighborhood uh-huh. and, well, many of the Germans had moved out, but it was primarily still a, a white neighborhood. Um, and at the time that I was dating her, um, things started to change. It, it bordered the east side. I mean, it was part of the east side, but it bordered what was basically the black neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And one of her friends was one of the first ones to dump their home. And um, like took a loss, just took a loss to sell it and get out. Jeez. And that that was the beginning of the white flight, because then it brought everybody's prices down. Nobody could sell it for more. Uh-huh. And then it was a race to see to get out before you lost all your money. Mm-hmm. And uh, that happened to my father, too. Um, um, in his neighborhood, um, it never it never changed. I don't I don't think it. um it was when he was. Was he the one to he sell was the house? Adult. He was. Not, well, they sold the house for like five thousand. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't his. It wasn't his house though. It was so his it parents, his, right, but he okay. had lived there too. It right. was two apartments. Right. But the same thing. The whole neighborhood had gone down in a in a short period of time, and. Um, I remember driving through that neighborhood with your parents Mm -hmm. um, because your dad wanted to see the house and they're like, roll your windows up, lock the doors. And I was, I like, I didn't get it. And I, I think that a lot of it was just like, I was naive. Like I didn't, I came from this bumpkin rural little town that, you know, like we were all white, you know? (laughs) So the, I was one of those racists that didn't see color and I like was thought that that was so great of me that I didn't see color and it's so racist. Now I see that, but it didn't make any sense to me when everybody was so paranoid about, you know, lock your doors. Yeah. So I just, I, I didn't understand it from, I think just like the, and I, part of it too was probably that I didn't grow up there. The racism in, in that area was just so terrible. And yeah. if I had grown up there, maybe I, I'm sure I would be more racist than I ended up being. I just think that I just wasn't raised and over there. So I didn't understand that part of it, but I also, because of where I was brought up, didn't have that part. I mean, I was 18 at the time. I didn't have the, um, the knowledge and the, I don't know the word that I'm looking for. I didn't have Ex- that, experience, the experience yeah. to be able to um, understand what was happening. Like I recognized that it didn't feel good to, to have somebody say that this is a neighborhood that we should lock our doors. Like it didn't make sense to me because I didn't feel unsafe, but then them saying we need to, we're not safe here. We need to lock our doors. And like, it, I was like, okay, you know, like I didn't call it out. Well, like I probably should have. Like we're just in a neighborhood, guys. <laughs> well, well, and we drove through there many times, and not once did I ever feel unsafe there. I was raised there, and it was an unspoken. It, it was. It wasn't like my my mother was like overtly racist. Okay, and just just wait. No, no, no. When I was a kid, it wasn't like she just said bad things about black people. Uh huh. But it was kind of just a general knowledge, you know, black people are scary. So it was, it was, you just, get that that's a problem though, right? Well, yeah, but growing <laughs> up when at, that's what life is, you yeah. don't, you don't think anything of it. I, I was, I'm not a critical thinker. Yeah. I don't think ahead. I don't, I don't think, I'm sorry. I don't. Um, <laughs> and, um, but as an adult, a young adult, I used to go, uh, cruising with my friend. We'd just get in our car and we'd go cruising. And we always went through the East side. We yeah. drove through there. 
um, not looking for trouble or anything, but we just drove because it was it was cool architecture and everything. I just love driving. Yeah, there. lots of history there. I mean, half of the books, half the books I I've written were about things that happen on the east side or, or architecture from the east side. I just I love the area. Yeah, but but also that was before it was a black neighborhood. Yes, all of that happened before it was a black neighborhood. Right. True. <laughs> um, yes, it was Polish for the most part at that time. Yeah. But. Uh, Sorry. No, it's okay. I was just wondering if I'm playing footsie or what. I don't know if it was a cat or what, but it's something else. Um, yeah, so, I mean, then there was uh, the neighborhood that, that we lived in um, that was uh, on in the west side, which yeah. is the opposite side. But that Main been, Street is the center. Right. Everything east of Main Street is the east. east side, and everything west of Main Street is the west side. But then there's the... Yeah, yeah. North I know. Buffalo. I know, but that's Buffalo. just the general. There's yeah. no north side and south side. It's north Buffalo, south Buffalo, east and west. Yeah, it is weird, kind of funny. It's a weird thing. Everybody has weird things, so. It's like it's like it's like I five in California. It's the five. Oh yeah. And the I don't know what other. Well, the, in New York, in New York, in Buffalo too, the is 90. the ninety, the yeah. two ninety, the one ninety. Mm, it's always and the California does the same thing, yeah. but up here it's I five. Yeah. <laughs> and I adapted to that, but. Yeah. Anyway, but back the, to the, the West Side was pra- primarily going back a hundred years was Italian. Yeah, I mean it was it was dominated by Italian people, uh, immigrants, and by the time I moved in originally, um, it was a, a well mixed neighborhood. Most of the most of the Italians had gone. Yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't a strictly black neighborhood. It wasn't. Um, there were a lot of Hispanics, though. It was yeah. uh, a lot of Hispanics had moved in, so it was kind of like the Italian to Spanish. It was almost a, a transition there. Yeah, one thing I loved was driving because we went to a neighborhood um, a doctor, family mm-hmm. doctor, and I I kind of loved being over in that area because you, mm. when you, you there were um, they they had a refugee, a lot of Africans. There was a clinic though upstairs, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That had. I think they eventually took it over, but it, they, 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 um, they did refugee services mm-hmm. up there. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of African, yeah. Journey's End. Journey's End, that's yeah. right. And so they did a, a lot, and I, it was probably religious and that, I'm not a huge fan of that, but anyway, they helped refugees and that's always mm-hmm. a good thing. Yeah. So it, anyhow, so that neighborhood also had that. So it was nice to kind of be in the area and I don't, at the time I didn't have enough appreciation for mm-hmm. it. Um, and I wish I had, because that was the other thing too, is trying to stay within staying in your neighborhood. And they talk about that and it talked about that in the interview for this book, mm-hmm. staying in your neighborhood and buying the things mm-hmm. from the people in your neighborhood because they're small businesses and they, right, you right. know, they're catering to their, the people that live there. And, you know, if exactly. you, if you leave the area and go, you know, uh, go to the suburbs Mm -hmm. to have your dinner, to buy your groceries or whatever, you're not helping your neighborhood. No, exactly. And that, that was something that, that they mentioned, you know, don't sit in your apartment and you need to have some foo-foo food. So you order Grubhub from the three neighborhoods over, Uh you know, get it from the guy down the street that already sells something. Maybe it's not exactly what you wanted, but yeah, but we did that when, uh, when I lived there, I became enmeshed in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, that was where that was. It all ties into my writing and everything. Right. It all started there. It was. I became part of the block club. I got involved in community meetings and community cleanings. Mm-hmm. I was in. I, I ended up being on the board of the West Side Neighborhood Services. Yeah, but I have a que- I mean, My services. question for you is: How many? Like when I think back about who I knew or who I knew was on that board with you you weren't on it long after they i were moved. all white people they were all white people they were they were there might have been but that doesn't represent that didn't no, represent the neighborhood didn't. so they weren't making it they were they were trying to to gentrify i don't know if they were trying to gentrify but we were trying to do things we were tried i would i would go to uh the stores on grand street which was right down the block mm-hmm. did you see that's up for sale yeah i saw that oh how sad but, apparently the kids don't want to take it over anyway but but that's the thing. Yeah. You know, we would try and go over there. The biggest, the closest grocery stores we would go to were in the area. Yeah. They were still in the city and they were still in neighborhoods similar. But Yeah, there wasn't really a... There a, wasn't one real close. I mean, the tops there. We didn't. There was like a corner. Yeah, like the corner stores and stuff. But yeah. if you need groceries, groceries, you have to... Go a little bit further out. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, we tried to. Yeah, I, we shopped I, in the city. I really tried to, to do a lot in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and like I said, I was involved in, in in stuff for some years. Actually, started the 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 grant 
whatever it was called. Grand Ferry. Grand Ferry Block Club or Neighborhood Association. Yep. And it kind of floundered for a while, but I just kept it going until it finally became something. Yeah. Um, we moved, so we left left it for other people. But uh, but yeah, I mean it. But it was a neighborhood. I bought a an 1892 house with four bedrooms for twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah. When we left, I mean, we sold it for three times that. Yeah. Um, and it's worth a uh, hundred thousand more than that now. Yeah. Because the neighborhood that it's tied to is an even higher priced neighborhood white. that is white. All primarily white yeah. and is pushing westward. Mm -hmm. So people just keep, uh, you know, keep buying property and prices And these landlords up. that own the houses, the, own the, you know, the doubles, mm -hmm. you know, jack up the rent until the people yeah. can't afford them anymore. And then they move out. And so the landlords sell their houses because now the house that they bought for $20,000 is worth $150,000. And, oh, yeah. and that's it. And that's how gentrification happens. And it is. And it's, you know, they, they say in, in their interview, their NPR interview, that there's some ways, you know, the, the, buying the, um, buying the food and shopping locally, it was one of the things, but, mm -hmm. um, they say that one of the things is artists are complicit in, in this because they go, you hear about it. Do you remember the huge warehouse fire a couple of years ago? Yeah. They, uh, and it was, it was one of those neighborhoods. Uh, where it was a, a cheaper building that they didn't have all the proper um, sprinklers and everything in it. Right. And a, a bunch of people died. Yeah. And it was one of those kind of things. But um, they were also saying that... They being? Uh, the, the creators of okay. bot Bottom Feeders, mm -hmm. that, you know, the white people have to do things. Oh, shoot. Where was it? This... I don't know what it was. Oh, well, it's kind of important, right? I thought it was. As but... white people, we should probably talk about it. <laughs> yeah, if I if I could if I could find what it was, but <clears throat> I mean, I don't want to quote the whole thing. But... Well, says, so do you believe with well, the question the interviewer? Do you believe that someone who moves into one of these neighborhoods can do anything to compensate for the effect of their presence? And Daniel says, I think so. Engage the community, get to know your neighbors in a meaningful way. Right, the most right. important thing is to keep money in the community. Just like we were talking about. Don't order from Grubhub. Um, three neighborhoods over. So, th yeah, that was exactly from that. Um, and Passmore actually says, I shouldn't disagree with Ezra in an interview, but I think one thing that has to be acknowledged is that a lot of black local business owners help gentrification by selling their businesses or sort of catering to new people. I think the solution for gentrification is to end the logistical benefits of white supremacy. And I think that's a project that requires everybody, white people, more than anyone else, obviously. Um, ultimately, it's not enough to spend your money somewhere else or learn the link local lingo. Yeah. If people move into the community, they have to commit to these communities. And I did, and I did when I moved into that community. Yeah. Uh, on the west side, I committed. Yeah. But I don't, I don't, I don't feel like he was really disagree disagreeing with him too much. But I mean, there isn't one answer. Yeah. No. You know. No. And dismantle white supremacy and the patriarchy. Yeah, and the, and and that's <laughs> the thing, you know, the, the white people they get scared of the black people or people of color of any color irrationally, and, <clears throat> irrationally, dump their houses, their properties. Um, then the stuff becomes cheap and then they start, uh, you know, somebody owns it still. So they start renting it out to, Oh, artists here, come it's, it's cheap. You can come live, you know, live work kind of thing, you know, in these big studios mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, eventually more of them come in and it becomes a cool place. And it's like, Oh, this is a cool place. So yeah. Property values are going up now, Yeah, you know, and then it, it, it drives them, pe them people out because they, they, they can raise the rents then. And yeah. it's this whole horrible cycle of things. Yeah. And. Well, we didn't even get into like the redlining that prevents people of color from purchasing houses. Yeah. That, that whole thing is horrible that, yeah. that, that they even did that literally drew red lines on maps on where yeah. they wouldn't even give mortgages to people. I mean, yeah. knowing that that still takes place is just horrible. I mean, it, it's, it's disgusting to think that it took place to begin with, but to know that it's stuff still comes up like that. You still, all of a sudden some big article will come out, some news story saying that it, some bank had been doing that. Or well, and that's our privilege that we get to read about it instead of experience it. Yeah. Uh, that, and that is a privilege. Um, but yeah. So bottom feeders um, really, really goes in into it in, in a completely different way. Um, 
to poke 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 you know into the poke poke into the white people's eyes and 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 show them that uh, hey you know you can't you can't always just come into a new neighborhood and and move into a building and and just everything's going to be good yeah oh and then the end the end where oh, they yeah, have yeah. that white savior shit uh huh yeah oh, yeah yeah the black people we all know are, yeah. we all know the white people that are like I'm not racist I have a black friend yeah but yeah basically at the end uh, when when everything unfolds um the the building owner's brother is like he was such a great man and and you know the, yeah well the, he he saved all the people and all this thing yeah he gave his life he yeah. gave his life <laughs> which he had nothing to, nothing to do with it oh man yeah. yeah and then she's like i'm going to be famous yeah the the white girl yeah and it was her apartment too even though she never spent the night. It, it wasn't months. hers. It was the other girl's apartment. Yeah, it was the other girl's apartment. And they had talked about moving in together. But then uh-huh. as soon as it came time to do that, she's like, uh, I don't yeah. know. Oh, yeah. Until until somebody at some fashion institute or something or somebody somebody found out that it uh-huh. was cool the that interview. you lived down there. Yeah. And she's like, oh, this is my apartment. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 She does get sucked into the building. She gets her comeuppance in 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 the building. Yeah, yeah. So, she but then in the end, it. she's it's she's the the uh, mm-hmm. the the famous the fun, one that's going to get famous exactly. Right? And the black girl that actually whose apartment it was is like seriously. You yeah, know? and uh, it, it, she I mean ended it. She's the one that called Charles Charles and uh, got him to come down. And then yeah, I I don't oh, man. It's so, which is what, and that's they ended it like that, which yeah. is like a typical ending to some kind of story like that. Yeah, because Charles' name never comes up. Like he mm-hmm. is the one that saved everybody mm-hmm. that was saved, and like nobody gives him any credit. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, that is that is typical. Yeah. All right. Well, it was a really good book. Awesome and, book. Um, we loved it. Yeah, the book that we're gonna have next week, it's gonna be a whole different story. <laughs> so I, I haven't read it yet, but I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, my name is Mike. And I'm Barker. And this is the The Graphic Graphic Novel Novel Podcast. Podcast. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, make sure that you like, share, give us a great rating. We love to hear back. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Graphic Novel Pod, or you can check out our Instagram uh, at Graphic Novel Podcast. Or you can uh, visit our website. We got a brand new website. It is graphicnovelpodcast.com. Or you can send us a, a comment or question or any kind of thing like that. Yeah, uh, we love li- hearing from our listeners. Yeah, request for uh, a, a book to be reviewed or anything like that to Graphic Novel Podcast at gmail.com. And biggest thing if uh, you're listening to the podcast and you like it visit your favorite uh, um, podcast um, distribution host, host uh, like iTunes or whatever and and give us a review give Stitcher. us start Stitcher or Breaker all them and, and give us a you know a review and stars because that's hey, if you give us five stars in a review we'll, we may read it on there. yes yes we will definitely and, and that will help us uh, expand the number of people listening that's to the our best show. way that we can share our show is by our listeners that's right so thanks for listening again this week